In this video, we're going to take a look at bond polarity. So we first need to look at our definition of electronegativity. So electronegativity is defined as the relative attraction that an atom has for a shared pair of electrons in a covalent bond. So we've looked at covalent bonds, we've looked at trends in electronegativity. Now we want to see how does this play into how the bonds we form in covalent compounds are affected by electronegativity. So let's look at our compound HCl. Now, H, if we look up electronegativity values, this has an EN or electronegativity value of 2.1. And if we looked up chlorine, that has an electronegativity value of 3.0. So what this means is that the one with the higher electronegativity value is the one where the shared pair of electrons is going to want to spend more time around. So we can represent this on our bond in a couple of different ways. Now, if electrons, these elect this electron pair wants to spend a bit more time around the chlorine than it does the hydrogen, what that means is that's going to result in a partial negative charge on the chlorine. It is not a full charge because we're not getting a transfer of electrons here from one to the other, but instead it's a partial charge. So we use the Greek symbol delta, the lowercase delta, and then a negative to indicate that that would have a partial negative charge. That means that the hydrogen would have a partial positive charge, okay, because the electrons are spending less time around that end of the molecule. We can also represent this with what we call a bond dipole. So a bond dipole is an arrow, but it's a special kind of arrow because we want to indicate on the one end of the arrow where the partial positive charge is, and we do that with the little tick mark. So the circle is not part of it. I'm just circling it to show you. This would be our bond dipole with the tick mark on the partial positive end pointing towards the partial negative end. So if we take one more example, if we look at water, for example, and we look at the OH bonds, let me just quickly draw on the Lewis structure here, and we look at hydrogen, hydrogen is 2.1, and oxygen is 3.5. So again, the electrons in these shared pairs are going to want to be spending more time around the oxygen. So each of these bonds would have a dipole that points towards the oxygen. Or these would be our partial positive charges, and the oxygen would have the partial negative charge. So knowing the electronegativity values and knowing the difference between the electronegativity values can actually help us to determine the type of bond we have in a compound. There are three main types, the first of which is a pure covalent bond, and this is where the electrons are shared equally. The second is a polar covalent bond, and we say polar because we have that bond polarity now. And you can see this HCl molecule, it would have a bond dipole pointing towards the chlorine because they are shared unequally. Finally, the last type is an ionic bond, and that's where the electrons are fully transferred from one atom to another, and we get that electrostatic attraction between the two ions, such as in sodium chloride here. Now, we can use electronegativity values to tell us what type of bond we have. It's really important to remember, though, that this is a continuum. So while I'm giving you specific values here, um, there is a certain amount of covalent character and a certain amount of ionic character. So if we have a change in electronegativity across the bond equal to zero, so say we had two fluorine atoms, then each has a 
electronegativity value of 4.0. So if we did the change in electronegativity, that would equal to zero. And that is considered to be a nonpolar covalent bond. If it's less than 0.5, this is still considered to be a covalent bond. It does have a little bit of polar character, character to it, but not very much. So you could just write polar, or sorry, uh, you could still just write a covalent bond for this type. If the values are between 0.5 and 1.7, this is a polar covalent bond, and you can feel pretty confident that that would be the case. So that's the case for HCl, for example. If we did that, remember the electronegativity of chlorine was 3.0, for hydrogen, 2.1. So if we did the difference there, it's 0.9, which fits into this category. Finally, if it's bigger than 1.7, it is very, very likely it is an ionic bond. And so this would be something like sodium chloride. If you did the difference there, what do we have? Sodium is 0.9, chlorine's 3. So we get 2.1 as our difference, which fits in with ionic bonding. Now, like I said, this is a continuum, and we actually have this diagram that is available in our data booklet to help us kind of see what the polar, nonpolar, uh, covalent, ionic character is within our molecule. So let's take our HCl, for example, again. So we had 2.1 and we had 3.0. On this scale here, on the y-axis, this is our electronegativity difference. So our delta En. So if we did the 3.0 minus 2.1, we get 0.9. So we can go up to about this point on our scale. On the bottom, on the x-axis, is the average electronegativity value. So this is where we're adding the two and dividing by uh, two, so we would have 3.0 plus 2.1 divided by 2, which gives us about 2.55, or 2.6, 2.5, whatever we want to round off. So about here on our scale. If we find where the, those two points meet then, you can see that it kind of sits in this polar covalent sort of section of our diagram. Now, if we continued to trace that over and looked at our other y-axis here, this gives us the percent that's covalent percent ionic. So it gives us, you know, how much of that bond has ionic character, how much has covalent character. So it's sitting around, I don't know, let's say about 80% covalent and 20% ionic. And so that tells us that it's, you know, it's pretty, pretty much covalent, but there is a little bit of ionic character, and that's where we're getting this polar covalent bond uh, coming from. So you should know how to use this diagram and just interpret those values from it. All right, finally, what we want to do is we want to take a look at a couple quick examples to determine what kind of bond it has. So when you see something like this, SF4, what we're really asking is we're looking at the SF bond in this molecule. So if we look up the values, sulfur is 2.5, fluorine's 4.0. So if we do the difference there, we got 4.0 minus 2.5 gives us 1.5. So that fits in our polar covalent bond area. So that would be, that would have a polar covalent bond. And you would have polar covalent bonds between each of the S's and the F's in this molecule. Let's look at CaBr2 now. So calcium, 1.0, bromine is 2.8. We do the difference, 2.8 minus 1.0 gives us 1.8, and that fits in the ionic bond section, so that would be an ionic bond. Finally, O2, 
oxygen has an electronegativity value of 3.5. So if we do the difference, we've got 3.5 minus 3.5, that's zero. So that is a true covalent bond or nonpolar covalent bond. That's it for this video then. Let's move on to our next task.